Are you tired of the nine to five lifestyle? Do you want more freedom to do what you want, when you want it, without sacrificing your current income? Then this is the show for you. Every week, we dive into John's journey towards financial freedom and everything he has learned since 2014. Real estate investing, cryptocurrency, stocks, private lending, foreign residency, tax saving strategies, infinite banking, assets protection, and much more. Now, here is your host, the founder of the Wealth and Freedom Nexus, John Rickgarn. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on when you're listening to this. This is John Rickkarn, your host of the Wealth and Freedom Nexus podcast. If this is your first time joining us, thank you for subscribing and be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't. And if you are following up again, welcome back. And I hope you get some more educational nuggets from today's podcast. Now, today I brought on investor who I met at the Summit at Sand in Belize last year, Paul Moore, who has been a very integral to the mobile home park space. Now, maybe you're like me, the first time you heard mobile home parks, you're like, or yee, or maybe got some, uh, shall we say, negative connotations in your mind. Maybe the uh, trailer park from Boy Meets World just pops into your mind. And I probably just aged myself as there's probably listeners that don't have a clue what Boy Meets World is. <laughs> but regardless, we're going to talk about mobile home parks. And if you want to keep an open mind, how this can not only be a very attractive investment class for you, but it can also be a, shall we say, part of the solution for the affordable housing crisis that our nation is facing and probably will be facing for the next couple of years. So with that, Paul Moore, welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be here, John. Thanks, Thanks, man. It's an honor. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for coming on. It's been a long, was it seven months, I think, since we met up at the summit. Just time flies by. (laughs) Right. So now maybe uh, first off, you can just give my listeners just a brief background on yourself and maybe how you got into the mobile home park investing space. Yeah, absolutely. So I had a uh, my own company in uh, the 90s and I sold it in 1997 to a publicly traded firm. And okay. when I left, I moved to the Blue Ridge Mountains to raise my kids and my wife and I had uh, two more kids and was looking for some, you know, cash flowing investments that looked easy. And so I, in ni- in the late 90s, around 99, I was thinking about this mobile home park down the mountain from me. And I was also thinking about self-storage because I use self-storage uh, for eight months when I moved while we were building a new house in the mountains. And um, I actually concluded that they would be pretty easy. Okay. But um, I was wrong. <laughs> and I uh, found that out later. I found out it was easy. It is easy to operate a mom and pop self storage or mobile home park operation, but it's really hard to do one really well. Okay. There's a lot of effort, a lot of time invested, typically in the self storage side, a lot more marketing. And so what happened is I didn't invest, thankfully. Okay. I ended up getting into residential real estate, started flipping houses, started building houses, did a small subdivision, started flipping lots at waterfront uh, waterfront lots at uh, Smith Mountain Lake in Virginia. And over the years, I kind of wondered, how do I get involved in commercial real estate? Well, uh, invested in an oil and gas deal in 2010 in North Dakota, and we found out there was a massive shortage of housing affordable housing or any housing in North Dakota. And there were like 10,000 people descending on the town near near where we invested. And there was a town of 3,000. And so this presented a huge problem for that town. And so uh, we quickly put our thinking caps on and we actually bought 75 acres outside of town. And we created a multifamily community there that was made up of a whole bunch of modular cabins that fit the North Dakota landscape. But we ran it as a sort of quasi extended stay hotel. So we were able to charge higher rates than multifamily. And we were able to give the tenants the flexibility of staying for a month 
or a week even rather than, you know, for a year lease. At any rate, after doing multifamily for a number of years and writing a book on multifamily that was humbly titled The Perfect Investment. Uh, <laughs> Very humbly. Actually, yeah. I got, uh, I got really tired of looking at all these overpriced uh, apartment assets and concluded, concluded that we needed to find a different asset type. And so we began looking for asset types that had more intrinsic value mom and pop opportunities. And okay. lo and behold, I looked back 20 years and I looked right at the asset types I had ignored or over, you know, basically decided not to do in the late nineties. It turns out, I think my intuition was right. I would have been a mom and pop operator and that would have been okay. But I tell you, a, a mid-sized operator or a professional operator, John, who can acquire a mom and pop mobile home park can often dramatically increase the value, the cash flow, and the ROI for his or her investors. And so okay. that's what attracted me to mobile home park investing. Okay, interesting. Boy, there's a lot to dissect there, but maybe just on the last part there, you had mentioned, you know, acquiring a mom and pop mobile home park, and that there's a lot of you know, shall we say value add or maybe uh, money left on the table? How is it that, you know, an operator is able to come in and, you know, improve that market and improve the operating expenses and make it more profitable for the investors involved? Yeah, I'm going to actually take a little deep dive here, if that's okay oh, with you. Sure, absolutely. And if you're listening, you might have to focus for just a few minutes here to get this math. Okay. Now, residential real estate, as we know, is based on comps. Mm -hmm. So if I take a $100,000 flip house and I add $300,000 in improvements, so I got 400 in it, I need to make over that to get any profit at all. Yeah. If it's in a $200,000 neighborhood, John, <laughs> I'm probably not going to make a profit. Very unlikely. <laughs> But in commercial real estate, it's based on that good old thing that your mom and dad told you to learn in school, which is called math. Now, okay. math it works like this. It's the value formula or the value increase is the net operating income divided by the cap rate or the rate of return. This is sort of like the P.E. ratio in stocks. If you've looked mm -hmm. at the price to earnings ratio, it's sort of the reverse of it. Okay. But anyway. The value of the asset is, again, the net operating income divided by the rate of return or the cap rate. Okay. And mom and pops have been able to watch cap rates compress by as much as 100% over the last 10 years. It used to be the cap rate, the rate of return people would expect as a buyer might have been 10 or 12%, Okay. meaning you could make a hundred or 120,000 a year from investing a million dollars. Okay. Now the cap rates are about five or 6%. So about half, meaning you'll only make 50 to 60,000 a year for investing a million or looked at differently. If you'd have to invest twice as much, 2 million to get the same approximately hundred thousand dollar cash flow. Okay. Okay. So mom and pop operators have known this because they've been getting offers all the time over the last few years for this suddenly newly found exciting asset class called mobile home parks. Because for years, mobile home park operators were looked down on. I mean, I didn't, I don't think I ever looked down on an operator, but honestly, my mama told me, stay away from trailer parks. <laughs> Nothing yeah. good goes on there. Well, like Robert Helms said, invest where uh, live where you want and invest where it makes best sense. And mm -hmm. this is a case of that. And so a lot of operators following the lead of the world's most successful real estate investor. Um, and that's Sam Zell. He has 158,000 mobile home park lots. Wow. And he's been doing that for decades while everybody else turned their nose up at this asset class. So that means the banks followed. That means operators follow. That means people chasing yield who were got squeezed out of multifamily, like I did, are you know now investing in mobile home parks. And so this value formula drives the increase in value for an operator. 
Yeah. And you asked that, that I'm finally getting around to your question, you asked how to add value specifically, would it be okay? If I use that setup to go through a specific deal? Sure, absolutely. Okay, please, please understand, John and audience, this is not exact numbers. I'm just using round numbers to make a, the point easier, especially if you're driving to work right now. Sure. So this uh, mobile home park was acquired in Kentucky for 7.1 million. Okay. The operator had passed away at least five years before. His wife had not been to the park. She lived three states away. She hadn't been there in at least five years. Wow. So the, uh, you know, the, the property manager was doing a great job overall, but she had no motivation to grow the income. Okay. She had no motivation to really maximize income and therefore maximize the value and the return to investors. She was just keeping it going and she was doing a good job. But there were several problems with this part. Anyway, he acquired it for 7.1 million. The first thing was water and sewer in this 311 lot mobile home park. Water and sewer was still paid by the owner. Oh, wow. So the owner was eating that cost. And let's assume for just this argument here that there was about 150,000 a year in cost. So that's about $500 Jeez. per lot per a uh, year from what I recall. So water and sewer is eaten by the owner. Now, the first thing the operator did is he went in and introduced himself day one. And he said, by the way, we're going to be putting meters in. It's a, a better environmental move. So people mm -hmm. don't waste water. It's a 33% savings, I believe on water and uh, sewer. And also we're going to be passing that cost back to you. And so that increased the net operating income by 150,000. And again, I'm yeah. rounding dramatically. Sure but it, it helps. Second, lot rents hadn't gone up in five or six years from my understanding, and they were 35% below market. Huh? Well, if lot rents hadn't gone up 30 in, you know, that long, and they were that far below market, it made sense. He might raise them a little, mm -hmm. especially if people, you know, when the, the, the option for these people would be, well, if they're mad that they got it raised, they can spend $5,000 to cart their mobile home to another park where they pay mm. more. Sure. It makes no sense. And so he only raised the rates uh, not that much. He, okay. he raised the rates less than half of, of the way to market. Okay. So let's just say he raised the rates, I'm going to say $50. So we're going to do this math live. We'll see if we can do it, John. Okay. So $50, there were 250 lots occupied. I think it's 260 to be exact, but let's just do that math. Sure. So $50 times 260 lots is mm -hmm. what would that be? 130,000 a year, I let's think. See. Well, 250 times 50 was 12,500. 260 times 50 would be 13,000. Uh, is 13,000 times 12 months. That's okay. 156,000 a year. Okay. So now he increased the net operating income, but without adding any costs by another 156,000 a year. Now we're at 306,000. Okay. He also saw that the expenses were quite bloated. Uh, and you can imagine how that could happen. This out of state lady is just paying people top dollar to get everything done, like maintenance mm -hmm. and management and everything else. And so he reduced, they reduced the cost of operations by 60,000 a year. Okay. So I don't know where we're at with the total, but I'll no, let you 366 tell you that. now. <laughs> okay. So 60, so it was 60,000 a year put us at 366. Is that yep, right? That's what I got so far. Okay. Now, in addition to that, and actually I'm, I'm kind of making this part up just to, okay. for our story, but let's say he started renting sheds and I don't actually remember if he did. We invested okay. heavily in this opportunity, but he started, let's say he was renting sheds for $20 a month. I mean, that's a really good deal for somebody mm -hmm. rather than go out and pay a thousand dollars to get a shed, right? So that increased the net operating income. And let's just say he added internet and cable and he got a profit share on that. That increased oh, okay. the net operating income. Let's just say he had an arrangement with a homeowner's insurance 
company that actually gave him a profit split that increased the net operating income. Okay. But the big thing he didn't do that he could have is fill those 51 vacant spaces from mm. 260 to up to 311. Okay. Uh, so that's, I think that's 51 vacant spaces. Yep. If he would have filled those, the value would have gone through the roof compared to what he actually did. But let's go ahead and see what the value is. So where were we with the, the numbers I gave you? 366? Yep, 366,000. So he increased the net operating income. Remember that value is the NOI divided by the cap rate. Mm -hmm. And so 366,000 divided by a cap rate of 0.05, that's 5%. Huh, okay. he just increased the value from 7.1 million by 7.32 million more up to 14.4 million. Wow. And that's all in six months, John. Yeah. But the cool thing is most of the value almost was left on the table by not filling up the last 50 spots. That's a yeah. lot of work, a mm -hmm. whole lot of work, especially with COVID when mobile homes are really hard to get. Sure. Well, now... He's got a, lot, a park that's now valued at 14 point something million. He got an offer for 14 million and he actually couldn't turn it down. He got him up to 15 million and he sold it <laughs> wow. in 10 months. So as an investor, as the largest investor in this deal, our company, um, like the other investors, got a 347% IRR. The return basically in 10 months was wow. 347%. Uh, if you want to look at it that way. So the, basically another way to looking at it is that there was 3.5 ish million in equity and okay. about another 3.7 million in debt okay. um, to acquire the mobile home park. And that 3.5 million in equity going in came out as 10.5 million in 10 months. Wow. Yeah. That's a nice little return for basically a year's Years time. <laughs> yeah. And it comes from being an expert who can find these deals. It comes from having safe leverage. It comes from all the meat on the bone that was left by this mom and pop operator. And it comes from just knowing how to make those improvements quickly and effectively. And interestingly, those tenants, they were still, you know, they were still paying less than all the, or most of the neighboring parks. Yeah. And so they were still getting a good deal. And what I love about this is the tenants were able to enjoy a nicer part because mm -hmm. the new operator came in and he added all kinds of nice things, cleaned up the park and made it a nicer, safer place to live. Okay. Wow. All right. So yeah, overall, definitely can see it as a, an investor play can make a nice little return where, you know, my single family homes have done very well, but I'll double check with my account. I don't think any of them has, has had a 340% return in one year, but <laughs> so, you know, there's tends to be a lot of negative stigma with, you know, mobile home parks, just kind of in society. And even in a lot of towns, they're, you know, not welcoming new developments and they're not, you know, doing permits for, yay, let's open another mobile home park here. Is that negative stigma you think justified or is that more outdated as time has gone by? It's justified from the, the county or city's point of view for this reason. Uh, typically, since the 50s or 60s, when this mobile home park was started, the town has grown around it. Okay. And so there's lots. I mean, I visited one right in a major suburb of Chicago. I mean, right there in the city. You know, okay. there's a mobile home park. And so um, the town's grown around it. And the problem is that mobile home park is paying extremely low property taxes, okay. but they have an, I would say, an inordinately high usage of services. Services would include obviously water and sewer, but they would also include school bus. They would include, you know, education. They would include fire and ambulance, you know, fire and rescue. Okay. All that is, you know, let's say it's average usage even, though the property taxes are only a fraction of what the homes are paying. So from a government point of view, if they're not thinking about the affordable housing need, then that might be justified from their point of view. Okay. Now, poorly run mom and pop uh, mobile home parks also attract, 
you know, tenants that might have more history in crime. They might not be able to get a, a home loan or whatever, but they might be willing and able to get a, you know, a mobile home, and especially if they're renting the mobile home, they're likely often historically they trash them when they okay. rent them. Uh, short-term renters, especially they're, they're just not, it's not a great business model and it's not great for the community. I, like I said, my mama told me to stay away from them yep. <laughs> but from an affordable housing point of view, looking at it on a macro level, it is a great, not only a great investment, but it's great for America because think about it. Six out of 10 people turn 65 every, excuse me, 10,000 people turn 65 every day. Six out of 10 of those who turn 65 don't have $10,000 saved for retirement. Wow. And since that's true, and since a lot of them do have home equity locked up, a mobile home park lifestyle is the best option for them especially okay. as rents have continued to skyrocket and new multifamily and single family is coming in on the higher end. Mm -hmm. It's squeezing a lot of people out. And as jobs go from 40 hours a week to some of them being cut to below 30 hours a week uh, since the healthcare things changed about a decade ago, honestly, there is a really, really big need for this. And it's the only asset type we know of, John, that has an increasing demand and a decreasing supply in America every okay. year. Well, increasing demand and decreasing supply. I think that's economics 101 for a yeah. you know, home run hit there. <laughs> that's exactly what we thought. And that's one of the reasons we really wanted to invest in mobile home parks. And um, we've, uh, we, we've just been really happy with it in the years we've been doing it. Okay. Very good. Now you had mentioned, obviously the, you know, kind of sobering statistics of the, you know, baby boomer generation, 10,000 people turning 65 every day. And of that group, 60% of them don't even have $10,000 saved for retirement. So if they do, you know, let's just, I'm just throwing out a number, say they have a house paid off free and clear, you know, I'll just say $200,000 worth from migrating from, shall we say, a homeowner to a mobile home park operator, as far as the numbers play out, how would that work from where the couple is now for their cost of housing to where, how they would be in a mobile home park community? Yeah. So what they would potentially do is take that $200,000 and they could go pay cash for a brand new double wide for about $75,000 and still have $125,000 left to party on. Okay. Now uh, they could also get a loan. They could get a hundred percent loan in fact, um, hmm. and just be paying that mobile home off over a number of years. And then they'd have $200,000 in the bank to okay. basically do whatever they want. And so um, it really, in, in addition to that, the annual property taxes should be less. Okay. Um, their annual cost of maintenance could be less. Uh, they, you know, typically have a smaller yard and less to take care of. They could also buy a used mobile home for, you know, maybe as little as ten or twenty thousand dollars. That's a depreciating asset, which okay. is, you know, makes it different from you know, your typical house, but they can buy one for sometimes 10 or 20,000, or they can even buy a fixer upper almost for free and okay. put maybe 20,000 in to fix it up. Uh, I've seen people do that before as well. Then their lot rent is, I don't know what the national average is today, but last I heard it was around $350 per month. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That's significantly less than I think the national average for rent is somewhere in the thousand dollars a month last time I looked. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And so what they're getting is, think about it. They're getting a yard. They're getting a way to pull right up in front of their front door, as opposed to an apartment where they have to walk up a bunch of steps mm -hmm. that are getting a little bit of control over their own destiny because, you know, Hey, they don't have to live in an apartment with all the rules and all the people next door banging around, making noise. They're getting a little bit of space for this COVID mindset where people want to spread out. They don't want to think that the person in the next apartment is giving them some kind of disease. 
they're getting a three bedroom house averaging, you know, let's say, for example, a thousand square feet instead of a two bedroom apartment that might be 800 square feet. Okay. There's a lot of advantages. Actually, I just looked it up. The average square footage, the last time I checked here, for a mobile home is 1,470 square feet. Okay. And the average apartment size at $1,000 a month is 900 to 1,000 square feet. So it's okay. actually 50% more square footage for a lot less money per month. Wow. Okay. Very good. And then of course the way my mind works for arbitrage, I'm thinking maybe the couple sells their house, you know, for a contract for D gets thousand dollars a month. And then that thousand dollars a month pays their three fifty lot rent. And then they still yeah. have, you know, 650 extra for yeah. living expenses, but that's the way my mind works. I don't know if everyone else is. No, that's a great idea. So yeah. Okay. That's good. Now you've kind of gone over the numbers, obviously, and you know, what makes a good mobile home park community, what makes overall like a good developer or maybe a good operator that people want to stay there. People want to, you know, don't want to move and obviously take pride in ownership where they're keeping it up and they're not, you know, run down or having several abandoned trailers or just maybe a lot of junk piling up, if you will. Yeah. So you want somebody who is, they really care about this. They're operating it as a business. Okay. You don't want somebody who, so there's an ad, there's an attitude out there that I heard 20 years ago when I first got into residential and that was, yep, buy a trailer park. It's little metal or it's big metal boxes that spit out cash. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe that's true, but you don't want that view. You don't want somebody who just collects checks. You want a professional operator who literally cares about the people okay. who, you know, wants to get involved and, you know, and, and, and they, they care. I mean, if somebody's sick or if somebody's car broke down, the manager's trying to help them out. Uh, the manager could live on site. Sometimes they live on site and you actually, this is one of the strategies to find a manager for a small to mid-sized park. And that would be to drive around before you close on the property <clears throat> and the day you close you go up and knock on the door of the one or two or three mobile homes that have really just a step above everybody else as far okay. as the nice picket fence, the manicured lawn, somebody who really cares. And you say, hey, how would you like to have free lot rent and X number of dollars a month just to do this part-time job and help me be my on-site eyes and ears? Okay. And so for a 20 or 30 or 50 lot mobile home parks sometimes that can you know be a good way to find the manager okay good to know yeah and i think uh that's hit the nail on the head with operating it like a business you know unfortunately i think a lot of the mom and pop operators just kind of you know call it a side hustle call it inheritance but they just run it more as a hobby than an actual business i mean if they were running it as a business it would have been more optimized and streamlined and you know more well taken care of along those along the years. Right. That's right. Okay. That's exactly right. And that's what makes a good mobile home park a mom and pop opportunity. I mean, there's 43,000 or so mobile home parks in the US, John. Wow. And we believe that 85 to 90% are mom and pop owned and run. And so this still has a lot of opportunity left, a lot of runway compared to multifamily that has 93% of multifamily properties over 50 units owned and operated by companies that have multiple assets. Yeah. And just like the mobile home space, I mean, you know, 5% cap rate, I've multifamily and apartments get to almost in the two and 3% cap rate, just so they've gone so compressed over the last decade. That's crazy. So, all right. Yeah. Well, as we're getting close to the end here, Paul, and wrapping up, I just want to uh, again, thank you for coming on, but is there any uh, new projects or a uh, new stuff that you're working on for 2022, either yourself or with Wellings Capital? Yeah. So Wellings Capital, actually, our goal is to be a due diligence partner for our investors. And so we go out and find the very best operators, the best assets, the best deals in these uh, various recession resistant asset types. And then we invest heavily in those and our investors join us. The investors get diversification across different asset types, geographies and operators. And 
Um, they also uh, know that we're looking for these types of deals like the one I mentioned in Kentucky earlier, which they probably wouldn't find on their own. Okay. And so we're launching a, a quarter billion dollar fund this April. Wow. And we're looking forward to, uh, you know, we expect to raise that much over the next five years uh, or so. I've also, <clears throat> excuse me, I've also got a new book in our other asset type. It's uh, in self storage. The book was published by Bigger Pockets Publishing recently. It's called Storing Up Profits Capitalize okay. on America's obsession with stuff by investing in self-storage okay sounds good and uh for those listening i will have these resources in the show notes clickable link i just started reading uh storing up profits so i'm definitely going to recommend that to my listeners obviously we don't have time today to go into self-storage but we can definitely dive into that um in another podcast perhaps so that'd be great yeah Thanks, John. now as a final note paul if anyone was maybe interested in hearing more about you, Wellings Capital, and, you know, maybe seeing if this investment class would work for, you know, their portfolio, or maybe even their self-directed retirement account. What's the best way to reach out to you? Yeah, we've got a full special report we've put together on mobile home parks investing okay. and also self-storage investing. And they can get those at wellingscapital.com Okay. slash resources. And that's W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S, wellingscapital.com slash resources. Resources. Okay. All right, John. Man, Sounds good. You. Well, I thank you again for coming on, Paul. I'll definitely have all these links and uh, resources here in the show notes and look forward to having you back on the podcast, maybe to talk about self-storage. Fantastic. I really love that. Thanks, John. Have a great so, day. You too. Thanks, Paul. Thank you for listening. Be sure to share, rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. For more updates, check out www.wealthandfreedomnexus.com. Remember, nothing on this show should be considered tax, legal, investment, or professional advice. This show is produced solely for educational and informational purposes. Please consult an appropriate and licensed tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for specific advice for your situation. For distribution or publication rights or media interviews, please contact the host.